father's involvement in his family. Now, let's look at some things, first of all, about about the wife. Let's go to verse 21. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, this entire scheme here in Ephesians 5 and 6 is talking about how we are to interact in the different stages of our relationships. We are told, first of all, that believers ought to submit to one another. We are also told that wives ought to submit to their husbands. Then we are told also in Ephesians 6 that children are to submit to their parents. And finally, that slaves, in our case, employees should submit to their employers. We're also told in the book of Romans we should submit to the government when conscience permits it. And so we see that there is a way in which we are to act in society. Now, there is a real sense in which I am, must be, you must be, sir, the head of your home. But never forget that authority in the Scriptures is much different from the authority that governed Rome. Rome's authority was to gain more and more power, to step on, to trample, to swallow up. But our authority as husbands is authority to serve. Christ, knowing that He had all authority, knowing where He had come from and where He was going, He took a towel and He wrapped Himself and He took the position of a lowest servant. We are granted authority only to serve inside the will of God. And it will result not in the suppression of our wives, but in their flowering. Not in the legalistic suppression of our children, but in their promotion, their growth, their blooming. So when we talk about authority, it has been granted unto us to die. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abideth alone. But if it dies... It bringeth forth much fruit. You see, sir, you're granted authority not so that you become the center of absolutely everything and your wife and children are nothing more than an extension of you. You are granted authority for their promotion in Christ. To take the place of a servant. Yes, it is your duty to die to yourself, to die to your buddies, to even die to your hobbies, to die to absolutely everything in order to lay your life down. One of the wonderful things about marriage is it provides for us in our contemporary Western culture the opportunity to suffer for Christ. The opportunity to carry out some of the most demanding, radical calls of discipleship. So do you really want to be a leader? Now, it says he goes on, he says, for... Verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Christ is the only Savior, the only mediator. But there is a sense in which the husband takes upon himself a saving role. As Christ is head of the church, the Savior of the church. So the husband is to be, in a sense, a means through which Christ's saving work is carried out in his wife primarily in the area of sanctification. He ought to be a demonstration of the love of Christ. He ought to be the tool in the hand of Christ used for the transformation of the wife. She ought to bloom and prosper and her life ought to be greater because of her relationship with this man. Let me say something that's very, very important before we go on. It's very, very hard for me to speak about headship because unconverted, unregenerate, religious Pharisees can grab a hold of these truths and use it to dominate their families. 
to subjugate their wives to some second place category, to make their children all walk in line like little animals. Listen, your wife is going to receive a stone with a name written on it that only she and Christ knows, not you. She's an individual in her own right. Do you see that? She is a daughter of the living God. You could come work in our mission and commit all sorts of failures, even immoralities, and we would forgive you. We may have to displace you, but we would forgive you. But I have a little daughter. If you hurt her, well, I guess the closest I would ever come to murdering an individual would be the man who hurt my daughter. Now think about that. It doesn't matter how valuable you think you may be in the kingdom of heaven. If you mistreat God's daughter, He will not even give regard to your prayers. It's amazing. Are you afraid? You should be. So should I. He goes on. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. What do you do with that, men? Except read it and be broken on your face. What a high calling. What I, I am called to love this woman as Christ loved the church? How? You talk about you need the power of the Holy Spirit to preach. You're cried out for the power of the Holy Spirit to do this? Because my friend, preaching is much easier than this. Just look at that. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Now, I want you to realize something. Christ... And it has been so clearly stated in the first sermon. Christ did not die for just this beautiful, impeccable, flawless creature. He died for a bride who was crying out, crucify Him. Do you honestly think your, your wife is to, is to come ready made? You'll give yourself to her in this way when she does what she's supposed to do. That's not what Christ did. When His own bride was calling out for His death, He died for her. Just hold your place for a moment and let's go to Romans. Eight. I mean, after all, it's all about sovereign grace, so we've got to go to Romans 8. Verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. The sunum bonum, or the greatest good of the Christian life, is our conformity to Jesus Christ. Actually, God is working in His sovereignty so that absolutely everything is orchestrated in our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, do you want to know what the purpose of marriage is? It is not to give you a little piece of heaven, but it is to conform you to the image of Christ. Now, let me teach you something. You, you know about all these organizations that are uh, uh, dating services. One of the things that they all have in common is they claim to put you with a mate who is compatible. Isn't it? That's the whole thing. Do a psychological exam. They're going to give you a mate that's compatible. Automatically, I can tell you it is not the will of God to use those services. Because in most cases, in His providence, God does not want to give you a mate who is compatible. Now, let me just share with you something. Imagine the way you would be if you had a perfect wife. I'll tell you, you would look like the perfect husband. 
you would look so compassionate. And why are you compassionate? Well, she deserves it. You would look so loving. You would lavish gifts on her. You would be so graceful with her. So kind. So gentle. You would practically adore her. Why? Because she was perfect. And everyone would look at you and say, you are the greatest husband in the world, when in fact Jesus would look at you and say, you are a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones and you need to wash the inside of the cup. Because the only reason you look the way you do is because she's met every one of your needs and desires. God will give you a wife that is strong in the areas where she must be strong so that you are not tested beyond what you can bear. But God will also give you a wife who will not be compatible and will oftentimes fail you in the very areas that you most desired in a wife. Now, why is that? 